Welcome to Vineyard Boise. It's our vision to make the invisible God visible wherever He places us. We come together on Sundays to worship and fellowship corporately. But we know that church isn't just about Sunday. It's about a lifelong day-to-day following of Christ with other believers. We invite you to join us just as you are. If you'd like to support our ministry, visit vineyardboise.org and click the Give Online button. All right, well, we're going to pick up in... um John chapter 21. We're actually picking up in a way where we left off after Easter. With Easter, we, we had you know, resurrected Jesus as kind of the Easter story. We're picking up after the resurrection in uh, the final days before he returned to the Father. So John 21, verse 1. After this, Jesus revealed himself again to the disciples by the Sea of Tiberias. That's another name for the Sea of Galilee, which is northern Israel. Uh, he revealed himself in this way. Okay, we're going to look at that in a minute. Let me pause there, though. Here's the time frame. Uh, Jesus uh, rose from the tomb and then spent 40 days um, still on this earth, in a sense, uh, before returning to the Father. But in that 40 days, he wasn't here in the same way that he had been during his incarnation, during his earthly life. It wasn't a constant presence. He kind of came and went as he saw fit. He already had a resurrected body, so he didn't have the same limitations as we do with our, with our you know, mortal earthly bodies. And so he came and went when he wanted. So what the, the, the encounter we're going to look at today is actually the third time that Jesus showed himself to a grouping of his disciples. And in that 40 days, he showed himself to many people, uh, sometimes in individual encounters, sometimes in pairs, uh, sometimes a group of the 12, a gathering of the 12. Uh, at one point, he actually gathers with, with over 500 disciples, 500 people who had become his disciples that were all together, and he appeared to them and connected with them, had an encounter with them. And the, the early writers of Scripture were adamant about this because they wanted us to understand, those of us that would come generations later, they wanted us to understand that there had been eyewitnesses of resurrected Jesus that saw him, that, that witnessed the, the holes in his hands, the holes in his feet, the hole, the hole in his side, that saw resurrected Jesus and had an encounter with him. That's why the early church was willing to lay down their lives for the story of the gospel, because they knew it was true. And so Jesus had many encounters during those 40 days. This is now the third one. The first two that he had with the disciples in groups um, had happened in the upper room where they had uh, taken the Last Supper in Jerusalem. Uh, Both times that he appeared there, the the door was locked and Jesus just showed up in their midst. And resurrected Jesus could do that. He had kind of fun. He would just show up and then he would leave when he was done without using doors. Okay, so that's resurrected Jesus. He's a little bit slippery. Hmm? They'd be talking to him and he'd disappear. Like the guy's on the road to Emmaus. He's talking to him and right when they start to say, we know who you, he's just gone. So this is now the third one. Simon Peter said to them, this is, there's seven of them gathered together, seven of the, of the original 12 disciples. These are likely all the ones that had been fishermen in their previous life. Uh, Judas is gone for obvious reasons. Uh, Matthew's not there. He's a tax collector. But we have the fishermen. They're up in northern Israel where Jesus had told them to go wait for him. Simon Peter said to them, I'm going fishing. They said to him, we will go with you. Now, here's the key here. This word going, when he says, I'm going fishing, the, the strength of that word um, in the original language, it's, it's, it's stronger than to just say, I think I'm going to go take a day off and go fish for the day. I need a, I need a down day. This is not, I'm going to go fishing today. This is, I'm going back to fishing. And Peter's going back to a previous vocation. And this place where they are, this Sea of Galilee, this is actually where he grew up. His, his dad had a fishing business on this lake. Um, John and, and James' dad had a fishing business on this lake. And so this is where these guys grew up, and this is where they'd first had a calling, where Jesus had shown up to them and said, I want to give you a higher purpose in your life than fishing for fish. I want you to fish for people. I want you to come with me. And Jesus had come to them, and he'd given them a calling that was far beyond anything that they would have ever imagined for themselves. But now things have changed, and Peter says, you know what? I think I'm just going to go back to fishing. The disciples said, we will go with you. Well, what had happened to Peter? Here's, here's what's happened to Peter in the last two weeks. Mark 14, this is before the, the crucifixion. Jesus is getting his disciples prepared. He's preparing them emotionally, mentally, psychologically for what's about to happen. And this is what he says to them. He said, uh, you will all fall away for it is written, I will strike the shepherd and the sheep will be scattered. But after I'm raised up, I will go before you to Galilee. 
Peter said to him, even though they, now this is what Peter says, they, and he points to the other disciples. This point, all 12 of them are together. He says, even though they all fail you, though they all fall away, I will not. Jesus said to him, truly I tell you this night, before the rooster crows twice, you will deny me three times. But Peter said emphatically, if I must die with you, I will not deny you. Peter's making some bold promises. In the hours that follow, Peter will fall asleep on Jesus three times when Jesus said, would you stay awake and pray with me while I'm praying to the Father? Three times Peter falls asleep. And then when the Romans or the soldiers come to arrest Jesus, uh, Peter flees with the other disciples. Uh, They follow at a distance. They follow Jesus to his first trial. It's a trial by night in the courtyard of the high priest. Um, A bunch of servants are are warming themselves. It's nighttime. They're warming themselves around a bonfire. And, um, And Peter joins them at the bonfire so he can watch at a distance and see what's happening with Jesus. And while he's there, three times people say, hey, aren't you one of those followers of Jesus, and every time he denies it. The third time, he cusses the person out. And Luke tells us that as he was cussing him out, uh, the rooster crowed, and then he looked over to where Jesus was on trial, and Jesus turned around and looked at him. And in that moment, their eyes connected, and he knew that Jesus knew. He knew that, that Jesus knew what he'd done. And the text of Luke says that, G, that Peter went out and he wept bitterly. He was, he was brokenhearted. So Peter watches the crucifixion, not just from the trauma of what's happening to Jesus, but from a place of knowing that his last encounter with Jesus was of absolutely failing him in the moment of his greatest need. So he says, I'm going fishing. <laughs> Apparently, he still loves Jesus. Let me, let's be clear. Peter loves Jesus, but he's, he feels disqualified from the calling that he once had. He says, I'm going fishing. They went out and they got into the boat, but that night they caught nothing. So that's discouraging. These guys, they know how to fish this lake. They've fished this lake their entire lives. They know the sweet spots. They, they know everything. They don't catch a thing that night. So that's pretty discouraging. Not only can they not fish for men anymore, now they don't know how to fish for fish. So that's an epic failure. Like, what a loser. <laughs> Verse 4. Just as day was breaking, Jesus stood on the shore, yet the disciples did not know that it was Jesus. Resurrected Jesus is slippery. Um, Jesus said to them, children, do you have any fish? They answered him, no. (laughs) He said to them, cast the net on the right side of the boat, and you will find some. Which, you got to know, like, they're like, why did not we think of that? (laughs) All night we've been putting the net on the left side. If we just put it on the right side, that we would catch fish. But the thing is, is I think there's something in them that says, you know what, this is familiar. This reminds us of something. And if you go back to the beginning, the very first encounters with Jesus they had, one of the very shaping ones is while they were fishing on this very lake, Jesus used their boat to teach from. And then when he got done teaching, he said, throw your, throw your nets in the lake. And they said, Jesus, we, we fished all night and we didn't catch anything. And they went ahead and did it. And then they, ca- they had so many fish that they caught that their nets were breaking. And at that moment, here's what had happened. Peter, he recognized, he didn't know who Jesus was. He didn't understand the entirety of who Jesus was, but he realized this guy's special. And he said, depart from me, Lord, for I am a wicked man. And Jesus said, don't be scared. You follow me, and I will make you fishers of men. So so in that very moment, in this place, he had an encounter with Jesus where Jesus gave him a calling that was far beyond anything he would have settled for. Gave him purpose. Verse 6, so they cast their net, and now they were not able to haul it in because of the quantity of fish. The disciple whom Jesus loved, therefore, said to Peter, this is John, he says to Peter, it's the Lord. Now when Simon Peter heard that it was the Lord, he put on his outer garment, for he was stripped for work, okay, and he threw himself into the sea, okay. Why was he fishing naked? I don't No. It was a bucket list thing. And and we've all got them. They're weird. But he's not going to wait till they get to shore. And they're only 100 yards away. That's like the length of a football field. They're not that far away. But he's not going to wait till they get in because this Jesus disappears. 
right? He's slippery, so he just jumps in the ocean, or in the sea, and he swims. The other disciples, a little bit bitter, the other disciples come in the boat, dragging the net full of fish, for they were not far from the land, but about 100 yards off. When they got out to land, on, on land, they saw a charcoal fire in place with fish laid out on it. Now note this, there's already fish there. That's pretty cool. Their fish laid out on it and bread. Jesus said to them, bring some of the fish that you have just caught. So Simon Peter went aboard and he hauled the net ashore all by himself. Full of large fish, 153 of them. The same guy who abandoned them made them bring the nets in. He now goes, he's like, I got this, guys. Get out of the way. It was just Peter, right? And although there were so many, the net was not torn. Jesus said to them, come, have breakfast. And none of the disciples dared ask him, who are you? They knew it was the Lord. Jesus came and he took the bread and he gave it to them and so with the fish. So now they have breakfast with Jesus around the campfire on the shores of the Sea of Galilee. And I want to suggest this, that that for for Peter, this whole moment's pretty awkward. Uh, Peter still loves Jesus. He still wants to do big things for Jesus. Jesus says, get the fish. He's like, I got this, you know? And he goes and gets the fish himself. But he's also confronted with his failure. The fact that the last words, the last conversation he had personally with Jesus, Jesus said, you're going to let me down. And he said, no, I won't. He made all kinds of bold promises to him. We're dealing with, with failure today. This is a defining moment. What happens in Peter right now is, is going to define how he sees God, how he deals with his own failure, how he deals with other failures. You know, um, the reality is when we talk about how does God respond to us and our failures, this is the Jesus encounter we're looking at. We're looking at how does Jesus deal with us when we have failures? How does God see our failures? Moral failures, relational failures, behavioral failures, failures in our calling. Like, how does God deal with that? And the reality is, that's how we think of that's all over the board. It depends on, um, you know, the family we grew up in. It depends on our own personality. We tend to project onto God the same way that we respond. If I respond to my own failures with, with anger, with, with uh, you know, with self-talk that's destructive, I think that God does that to me too. That's, that's, we project our own temperament. If we, get, if we blow up when other people fail us, if we blow up and we shame them and, we, and we're angry at them and we yell at them, we tend to project that onto God. We are shaping experiences. Maybe we've had a, a moment where we failed somebody and, and because of that, we, we have tendencies to, to think that God responds that way. You know, when I was 14 years old, I took driver's training. Uh, back then we could. Idaho was farm country, right? So we... Driver's training was 14. I had my license when I just barely turned 15. And um, I couldn't drive. My mom and dad didn't let me drive by myself. I didn't have my own car anyway. So I had to drive with them. But, um, but there I was, 15, just barely 15, driving with mom and dad. And mom and dad had got a new car. It, was a, it, was a, it wasn't brand new, but it was new to us. And it, it was up until that point, it was the nicest car we had. It was a Buick Century. And one night we'd gone to church. It was a Sunday night. We went to church in the evenings back then as well as mornings. Um, I don't know why. Um, but uh, we'd gone to church that night, and, and church was over, but mom and dad were standing around talking, as they were prone to do. And, uh, and so I was bored, and I said, hey, how about if I go get the car, and I'll just bring it around front, you know? And I, pr- I made all kinds of promises. You know, I promise I'll, I, 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 w- I won't go anywhere. I'll drive really carefully. I won't leave the parking lot. And some of you know that building. Like, I was parked facing the gym, and I just had to drive around the side of the building to the front. And, they're, you know, it's like 200 yards. And, and so they're, they're like, well, okay, what could happen at 200 yards? <laughs> so I, I go out, and on the way there, I run into one of my friends, and I'm like, come on, I got the car. <laughs> and so we go get in the car, and we start it up, and we're, and we're listening to music blaring. And we're not driving anywhere because they're going to be there talking for a while. So we're just sitting in the car with the engine running, with the stereo cranked. We're listening to, to the radio, and it was, I, I know this vividly, it's, it's etched into my brain. It was Run DMC, Walk This Way. Okay? <laughs> the, the, you know, the Aerosmith cover. And um, we're listening to it, and then we see one of our other friends coming towards us and gesturing like he wants to join us in the car. And in that moment, we had a decision. Like, we, either we can let him in or we can lock him out. We locked him out. <laughs> I was like, lock the doors! And so I threw it in reverse and flipped, a, uh, like I turned out really fast, and it was impressive. 
Like, it was a nice maneuver. It was like Duke's a hazard. I drive out really fast. The problem is I got to the end of my 180, and I didn't stop and put it in drive. I just kept going backwards, and so I just rammed the truck that I was parked next to. And that truck had its tailgate down. Big old white Chevy had its tailgate down. And I rammed and I high-centered the Buick on the back of the truck so that the Buick was now stuck. <laughs> Having to walk inside and tell mom and dad what just happened, that was a defining moment. And understand this, what, psychologically, whether I ever recognized it or not, how they responded in that moment would come to shape the way I think about God when I mess up, when I've blown it, when I've made promises to Him and I've, and I've failed. And they could have shamed me, they could have held it over my head, they could have blown up, they could, there's any number of negative responses they could have had. I don't actually remember exactly what happened in terms of the conversation, but I remember they were surprisingly merciful. And they were, of course, they were upset, but they were surprisingly, shockingly merciful to me. And um, it had been a rough, it had been a rough summer for me. And so that was really big. That was really big that in that moment they were merciful. And I know to this day that that's, and I've had other failures, but I know that that's part of, that shaped the way that my earthly parents, my father, the way that he showed me God in that moment, has shaped the way I see God. Now, I know as a dad, I've, there's times I've done that well with my kids, and there's times where I've also blown it. I've misrepresented. I've distorted God to my kids. I want you to just take a moment at your tables and just share stories of a moment of personal failure. Didn't, clearly, everybody at the table can't, but somebody at the table's got a story. Just share a story and whether how people responded, for good or for bad, how people responded. We connect over these things, so just take a moment to connect together. All right. Got 15 seconds. Wrap up your stories. All right. Some of you really enjoy sharing stories of personal failure. And if you didn't get a chance to share yours, or you want to finish yours, you're welcome to stick around after we pray and close the service and share your personal failure. That's really fun. But you know what? Here's the reality. There may be people at your table that you would not have known that you have a lot in common with. Sometimes we, we look at people on the surface and we think, yeah, I don't think I could connect with them. We're not, we don't have much in common. But then we start sharing our stories and stories have a way of connecting us. We realize, gosh, we do have a lot in common. There's a, there's a commonness to our humanity and there's a commonness in our, our desire as Christians to, to grow in, um, in responding to God that, that actually knits us together. So um, thank you for taking a minute to do that. Here, let's go back to the, this place where they're having breakfast. So the story, again, this is where it's happening. Um, Jesus has, has invited them to breakfast. He's made breakfast for them, which is just beautiful. Which, I want to say this, in their culture, to share a meal with someone is an even bigger deal than it is to us. We know that just as we, as we read the stories in Scripture and we see Jesus hanging out with tax collectors or people with questionable reputations, and other people are offended by that. They say, he's eating and drinking with sinners and prostitutes. And people were offended by that because in their culture, to eat with someone was to identify with them, was to say, I want to be with you. I want to be known as someone who's in your group, who's, who's in relationship with you. I identify with you. And so when Jesus makes a meal for them, it's not a small thing for the, he calls them together. But I think that that breakfast, and we don't know, I'm reading between the lines a little bit here, but I think that breakfast was awkward for Peter. Because, um, you, you know the phrase, the elephant in the room? It means that there's something big that's not being discussed, that's like everybody knows it's right there, but nobody's talking about it. There's an elephant around that fire. And for Peter, it, it's, it's this, that he knows that he failed Jesus miserably. And, um, and he hasn't dealt with it yet. And, and how do you bring that up? Um, say, Jesus, do you remember that whole rooster thing? You know, like, like, how do you broach that conversation? And so mercifully, Jesus does it himself. Jesus breaks the ice. Listen to what happens. 
When they had finished breakfast, Jesus said to Simon Peter, Simon, son of John, do you love me more than these? He said to him, yes, Lord, you know that I love you. He said to him, feed my lambs. When he says these, what do you think Jesus, Jesus gestured, right? Is he gesturing to the other disciples or to the, you know, the fishing implements, the net, the boat? I think he's talking about the other disciples. I think Peter, remember just two weeks before, Peter had said, hey, even if all of these leave you, I won't. And so now Jesus is talking to him. He says, Peter, do you love me more than these do? And Peter would love to be able to make all kinds of big, audacious promises. Oh, yeah, yeah. These guys are just, they're just clowning around. I mean, they like you, but I love you, right? Like, I, I, Jesus, I've got this. Like, I'm your guy, he would love to be able to do that, but he's been confronted with his own weakness. He's been, he's been confronted with the fact that he actually loves himself more than he loves Jesus. That in the moment where he had to choose between the two, he chose self-protectiveness. And so he can't say a whole lot. He can't make the big promises anymore because what could he say? So he just says, you know that I love you. Scholars will actually, you can read this, you go, you go read a commentary about it. There's actually two different words for love being used here. Some scholars think that Jesus is asking about the nature of his love. Regardless, listen to this. So Jesus said to him a second time, Simon, son of John, do you love me? He said to him, yes, Lord, you know that I love you. He said to him, tend my sheep. He said to him the third time, Simon, son of John, do you love me? Peter was grieved because he said to him the third time, do you love me? And he said to him, Lord, you know everything. You know that I love you. Jesus said to him, feed my sheep. He's grieved because Jesus keeps asking him, and he's like, what can I say? I can't make the promises anymore. Peter, Peter has actually come to terms with, with the lack of love that he has. And Jesus had said to them, Jesus had said, greater love has no one than this. Like, here's the highest bar for love. Greater love has no one than this than, than, than a, a man would lay down his life for his friends. And Peter saw Jesus do that. Peter saw Jesus have that kind of love to lay down his life for his friends. And so he'd love to be able to say, you know, yeah, I'll die for you, but, but he didn't. But Jesus asked him three times, and I don't think Jesus is rubbing his nose in it. He's not holding it over his head, lording it over him like, do you really love me, Peter? He's not rubbing his nose in it. He's giving him three chances to be recommissioned because Jesus knows that Peter denied him how many times? Three times. Three times he fell asleep. Three times he was asked, are you one of his friends? And he said, no. So three times he says, do you love me? And then all three times he responds with a new commissioning. And remember, this is the very lake after a moment where they caught a whole bunch of fish where Jesus said, okay, I've got a calling on your life, Peter. Come follow me and I'll make you fishers of men. And, and now here, Peter's, he's, he loves Jesus, but he blew up the calling. So now he's just a fisherman again and not a very good one at that. And Jesus says, follow me, feed my sheep. And so he gives him a, he, he redefines his calling. Instead of saying, come fish for men, he gives him a new metaphor to understand it with. He says, feed my sheep, feed my flock, feed my lambs. And, and that, that calling, so he basically reinstates Peter's calling. That calling so impacted Peter that at the end of his life, you read um, a letter that he wrote to a, a church that's being persecuted, uh, 1 Peter. 1 Peter is, is Peter writing a letter to a group of Christians uh, th this is some 30 years later, that are being persecuted and, and tempted to deny their faith in the same way that he had. And he's so tender and so affirming to them because he's been in their shoes. And, and the metaphor he uses throughout that book is the metaphor of sheep and shepherd because that just, it was a shaping moment for him. Jesus goes on to say, so now, so, so they, they sit around the fire, they have that conversation with everybody sitting there, and then at the end of it, Jesus stands up and he says, follow me. And he calls Peter. And once again, he says, follow me. And as he says, follow me, he, he and Peter leave. John, like the rest of the disciples stay there except for John. John's like, what's going on? So John kind of follows him. You can read about that in the end. But he says to Peter this, truly, truly, I say to you, this is just the two of them. When you were young, you used to dress yourself and walk wherever you wanted but when you're old, you'll stretch out your hands and another will dress you and carry you where you do not want to go. And our author explains what Jesus meant by this. He says, this he said to show what kind, by what kind of death 
Peter was going to glorify God. And after saying this, he said to him, follow me. There's a strong tradition in church history that Peter was uh, crucified in Rome under Nero's persecution around 64 AD. That's about 30 years after that commissioning. And what happened to Peter in that 30 years in between the fire there at the beach? And did you catch that Jesus recreated that whole scene like Peter denied him three times by the fire, warming himself by the fire? And then Jesus sets a fire? Like he orchestrated this whole thing. In fact, the whole reason they're in Galilee is he said, he told them, he said, go wait for me in Galilee. Jesus cared so much about Peter, he orchestrated his recommissioning. That's just beautiful. In the 30 years between this moment and the end of Peter's life, Peter will be, he'll be crucified in Rome, upside down, upside down because he didn't feel worthy of being crucified in the same manner as his Lord. And so he asked that he would be crucified upside down. Greater love has no man than this, that he would lay down his life for his friends. Jesus basically said to Peter in that moment, says, Peter, follow me as you are. The warts, the wrinkles, the the promises that you've broken, the stuff that you're not proud of, everything that you want to be and everything that you're not yet, just follow me as you are, and I will turn you into the kind of man that can lay down your life for your friend. So when he said that to him at the end, it wasn't a warning when he says, there's going to come a day as an old man where they're going to lead you where you don't want to go. That's to the cross. He's not saying that as a, as a warning. He's saying it as a promise. Hey, Peter, I'm going to turn you into the kind of person that loves the way that you want to love. Your job is to just follow me. You know, we said that, that this, we're not studying these stories just out of curiosity, just to understand historical Jesus We're doing this to make space for personal encounters, that we would have a personal encounter with Jesus. So we can't leave this at that fire pit 2,000 years ago. Here's what I'm going to ask you to do. In the beauty of this morning, you're sitting in a circle. I want you to just close your eyes for a minute. We're just going to pull the lights down. I just want you to be present in this moment. And with, with your eyes closed... Just place yourself in the story. Imagine that you're not sitting around a table, but you're sitting around a fire. And the people that, are, that you're sitting with, it's, it's other disciples. And Jesus is there as well. And Jesus is there because he wants relationship with you. He has orchestrated this moment. He has pursued you. I'm just going to ask you to take a moment. Is there anything between you and Jesus, anything that's blocking relationship? Is there an elephant around the fire for you? Let me give you some ideas of what some of those things could be. Maybe maybe you too have experienced failure as a Christian. Maybe it's moral failure. Maybe it's relational failure. Maybe it's behaviors. Maybe maybe it's it's due to your calling. Maybe you sensed a calling at one time in your life that was that was about God's work, and you've abandoned it. Maybe you feel unworthy. Is there anything between you and Jesus? For some, it may be that you've never had a sense of calling. You've always felt like you were on the outside. That you look around at the other people at church and think, oh, they all have callings, but I'm just kind of stumbling my way through life. God couldn't use me. Maybe there's something in you that wishes that, that, if, that if Jesus said to you, follow me, I've got plans for your life. Beyond salvation, I've got plans that have to do with you having meaning and purpose in your life that's far beyond what you can create on your own. Maybe you sense that, that if Jesus was to call you, you would jump up and you'd follow him. Here's the secret about following Jesus. When he says, follow me, 
We don't know what his plans are. We just know who we're following. We're following the purpose, not the plan, or the person, not the plans. I can tell you from experience, from my few years here, the plans that God has for you are more than you can even imagine. If he's calling you and you say yes, you don't want to know. You don't want to know yet until it's time. But I can tell you this, he's altogether good, he's altogether trustworthy. Think about how you've experienced God in terms of your failures. Have you seen him as somebody who is mad or disappointed? Somebody who's washed his hands of you? Somebody who's just done with you? Or do you see yourself as invisible? That he doesn't even know you? Let this story that we're in this morning, let it rewrite those tapes that you play. Jesus knows you. He's pursuing you. He wants to eat with you. He wants to be identified with you. And it's not because he thinks you're perfect. He actually knows you better than you know yourself. He actually knows all the flaws, all the failures. He knows the broken promises, and he still loves you. And he says, follow me, and I will turn you into my image. I will form Christ in you. Some of you may have felt disqualified from a calling. Maybe you still love Jesus, but you just feel like, you know what, I blew it. He can't use me anymore. Maybe today is the day to say yes to Jesus. Maybe today is the day where Jesus is saying, you know what, feed my sheep. Let's reframe your calling. We can't change the past, but the future's unwritten. So let's reframe it. Follow me. With all eyes closed... Let me just ask you, if God is stirring something if you, if you imagine yourself in this story, sitting next to the fire, wanting to follow Jesus into the place where he would take you, whether it's a brand new calling, whether it's restored calling, whether it's just letting yourself experience forgiveness for your failures. If you want to follow Jesus today, would you just stand up right where you are? All eyes closed, just stand up where you are. Here's Jesus' commitment to you it's bigger than your commitment to Him. And he's promised that he will form himself in you. He will turn you into the type of person who loves with the greatest of loves. He'll set you free from the idolatry of self-protectiveness, selfish living. Turn you into the type of person who can live for others and live for him. If you're sitting down right now and you're part of our prayer team, Would you just open your eyes and look around the room? If you've been trained for prayer, maybe you haven't been through our prayer training, but you've been walking with Jesus for a while yourself, and you've been down these roads, would you just look around and would you go to people? Maybe maybe God's going to stir somebody in your heart. Would you just go to somebody and just just spend a few moments praying with them? As we do that, we're going to have some words for prayer we're going to put up on the screens. These are specific words that our prayer team has sensed this morning things that, situations, conditions that God wants to address. And if you see yourself on that screen, would you just stand up where you are? I'm 
prayer team, if you would just spread out in the room. There's people who don't have anybody praying with them, so if you're qualified, get out there. Tend his sheep, feed his flock. There's the words for prayer. Loss of vision in the left eye, muscle weakness, frequent and severe headaches. If that's you, if you'd stand up, maybe wave your hand. One of our prayer team will come to you. I'm just going to close this with a word of prayer. And if you're ministering with somebody, you're praying with somebody, just go ahead and keep doing that. Um, We want you to stick around and talk to each other, share failure stories. And maybe you can do that over lunch, support the youth group, go to the uh, financial meeting or find a circle to be a part of. But if you just honor what's happening in the room, let people keep getting prayer and praying with one another. So let's just keep the noise level down, and let me close in prayer. Heavenly Father, I thank you that you do not deal with us according to our failures, but you deal with us according to your faithfulness. And I pray that you would form Christ in us, that for each one of us as we offer ourselves to you, that you would turn us into the best version of ourselves, that version of ourselves that reflects you with fewer and fewer distortions, that version of ourselves that has a growing love for you, and love for others. That like Peter, we would become the type of people whose joy would be to lay down our life for you and for other people. So we give you an unqualified yes. Would you take us where you would have us to go? In your name, amen.